Policy change not only helps the widest swath of people and that once we change our laws, we can change the realities for everybody, but it goes towards this bigger idea that we need to ensure that menstruation and other aspects of our lives are destigmatized, aren't marginalized. So supporting policy does both. Welcome back to the Essentially You podcast, all about reinventing your health with safer, cheaper, more effective natural solutions and powerful lifestyle changes so that you become the CEO of your health. I am your host, Dr. Marisa Snyder. Do you find yourself aligning with something bigger than yourself? Maybe it's a mission you were born to support. From a very early age, probably in my late teens, I always wanted to work with women and help women step into their greatest capacity. And I remember when I was sick with my hormone issues, I thought I lost that capacity. So when I got well, I knew that I was gonna focus on women's hormone health. When we are healthy, we show up for our family, for our friends, for our businesses, we can conquer the world. As simple as this mission is, I've learned a lot of other ways to support women especially around the world too. Next month, drum roll please, I will be hosting my second annual Women's Hormone Summit during the third week of October, and I believe the kickoff date is October 21st. Mark it on your calendars today. My goal for this event is to provide you with expert advice and interviews addressing a variety of topics for hormone solutions and solutions for our body that address emotional well-being, overcoming trauma and limiting beliefs, and also supporting things from menopause support to a low inflammation lifestyle, and so much more. We are covering it all, and the speakers, along with their content, have been nothing short of miraculous. And the proceeds from this event, if you were able to go to the event, attend the event last year with the other 50,000 plus people, you know that the proceeds from this event are going to very powerful causes that support women worldwide, not just here in America, but we will be supporting women in America as well. Because I believe that all women should have access to reproductive health care. I also believe that everyone, including women and girls, deserve human dignity. Days for Girls and Just Like My Child are two of the organizations that I will be helping to support I will be helping to raise money for. And their goal is to increase access to menstrual care and education that shatters stigmas and limitations for women and girls. By giving girls the education and the tools they need to be able to go to school and manage their period, we're ensuring another generation, the future generation, doesn't have to be held hostage by her hormones and normal functioning of her body. In today's conversation with advocate and attorney, Jennifer Wise Wolf. She and I will be talking about how to give women equal, adequate access to menstrual supplies and reproductive health care because it matters and it's time for a big change. This episode may get a little political and may get a little charged, but health care is political and politics are personal because they truly impact our quality of life, especially women's lives around the world and here in the U.S. Jennifer is a passionate advocate for issues of gender, politics, and menstruation. She was dubbed the architect of the U.S. campaign to squash the tampon tax. Yes, we are taxed for tampons and menstrual supplies when we should not be here in this country. Before I bring Jennifer Wise Wolf on, I want to take a moment to celebrate you because by celebrating you, we empower women to step into owning their health and wellness and getting educated and knowing what to do for their bodies. One particular healing rock star is Colleen, and I'm so excited to shout out her win that she shared on iTunes just a couple weeks ago. Here is what Colleen had to say. I thoroughly enjoy Dr. Maurice's podcast. I've been listening to them and sharing them with others for almost a year now. Dr. Marisa, along with her expert guest speakers, have addressed a wide variety of health topics that have been especially relevant to me and the health challenges that I have faced as a woman. I have really appreciated the emphasis that she places on the importance of daily self-care, the role it plays in creating optimal health. I also appreciate Dr. Marisa's energy and passion for sharing topics that empower us to all become the CEOs of our own health. These podcasts have been an integral part of my morning walks. Colleen R., 
Well, thank you so much, Colleen. I am so grateful that I get to be along your walking journey every single morning. And thank you so much for sharing your big win about healing all the things that you're working on for you and your body. Now, I have some incredible episodes this month that I think that you are absolutely going to love along with the Essential Oils Hormone Summit that I know you're going to love in October. Now, if you're listening, Colleen, I would love to gift you a signed copy of my book, The Essential Oils Hormone Solution. As you know, this book is packed full of essential oil rituals, self-care rituals, and recipes. I mean, it's so up your alley. All you got to do is reach out to me on Instagram or Facebook at Dr. Marisa, and we will get you hooked up with a copy ASAP. Now, if you are listening, first, welcome to the show. This podcast is all about empowerment. And if it has helped you in any way at all, I would love to shout you out too. You can reach out to me via Instagram, Facebook, or simply review this podcast on iTunes, which by the way, we are so close to 300 reviews. Oh, that just means that we are helping so many more women get their bodies exactly how they want to feel. Now, whatever podcast you plug into, we are all over the place from Stitcher to Spotify to Google Play. And by all means, continue sharing the love, whether it's on Instagram or social, whatever feels right for you. If you're having conversations over brunch and mimosas, whatever that may look like, by all, just keep sharing the love. That way I can continue to support more women who are ready to step into their power and become the CEO of their own health. Now let's dive into this incredible conversation with Jennifer Wise Wolf. My goodness, you are going to love everything about Jennifer. She is such an incredible advocate and she is ready to get the word out about stopping the tax on menstrual care. Jennifer Wise Wolf is a co-founder of Period Equity and vice president and inaugural Women and Democracy Fellow of the Brennan Center of Justice at NYU Law. A passionate advocate for issues of gender, politics, and menstruation, she was dubbed the architect of the U.S. campaign to squash the tampon tax by Newsweek. Her 2007 book, Periods Gone Public, Taking a Stand for Menstrual Equity, has, lent, has lauded by Gloria Steinman as the beginning of liberation for all of us. She has been featured in the New York Times, Washington Post, LA Times, Time Magazine, Cosmopolitan, Bazaar, and so many publications. Note that she is doing the good work, and I can't wait to welcome her to the show. Welcome to the Essentially You podcast, Jennifer Weiss Wolf. How are you doing today? Very well. Glad to be here. I am so happy to have you. You know, when I heard your episode on my dear friends, Nicole Jardim's podcast, I was so inspired by the work that you were doing. And what we're going to be talking about is the politics around periods. And I know this has been an area of focus for you for quite some time. I know your book had come out in 2017. But what I want to first start with is really your story. Like what inspired you to be such a powerful voice and advocate for women's health? particularly around our menstrual health. I love telling the story, but it's such a good place to start for so many reasons because I'm an attorney and a policy advocate by day. And there aren't too many people, I think, who, you know, who grow up thinking that they want to be an attorney on behalf of menstruation or, or this particular aspect of our lives. And it's turned out to be just such an incredibly fertile, no pun intended, and rich area to explore the law and the context for U.S. policymaking, and to really also make real change in people's lives. So it's just proven to be an actual life-changing experience for me as well. The story actually doesn't even go back all that far in the scheme of things. I kind of stumbled across this issue truly on my Facebook page uh, about four and a half years ago, exactly on New Year's Day 2015. So it's not too many times in life where it's such a clear marker of life before knowing this and life after knowing this, but it was New Year's Day 2015. And I was on Facebook. I was actually posting some pictures of my, my New Year's Day activity, which was doing the Coney Island polar bear swim, literally freezing cold swimming here in New York City. But I was posting pictures and I came across this post from a local mom in my community that her two daughters, who were 11 and 14 years old at the time, were collecting tampons and pads for our local food pantry. And that was it. They were just seeking donations. And you know, my first instinct was to respond to her and say that I'd be very glad to make a donation. 
But I started just kind of obsessing over this idea. Why was it that a food pantry wouldn't have this in their budget? Would people afraid to ask? Was this something that they were prohibited from doing? Did they not have enough funds to do it? And I really wanted to sort of dig into this question about menstruation and how, how, how it exists in sort of the public spheres in which we live. So you know, I started doing a ton of reading and trying to just gain as much information and background as I could about how people were talking about menstruation and particularly lack of access and lack of access to menstrual products. And the rest kind of unfolded almost in this like real time joke that is still playing out. I just started thinking about it and talking about it and basically haven't stopped since then. Back in 2015, around in January, I actually wrote a piece about it. It was, it was not intended to be sort of a clarion call for myself or others. It was more a way to sort of reconcile all these, these ideas that were spinning in my head about what it meant to be able to manage menstruation, about the stigma of menstruation, about what it meant to be able to afford menstrual products and how that could or couldn't inhibit somebody's ability to participate, whether in school or it at work or just in their daily life. In putting all those ideas to paper, I wrote this essay about it. I always think the New Year's Day piece of the story is relevant to me anyway, because it wasn't just like some kind of mucky day in March where I heard the idea and then moved on, but I had all this like New Year's resolution adrenaline in my system too. So when I wrote this piece, I thought, well, well, what's the most I can do with this? How can I ensure this gets the audience that I think this discussion deserves? So I submitted it pretty much cold to the New York Times and much to my surprise and delight, they ended up running the piece. So it really created this large audience for this discussion for me right away. And as a little bit of an epilogue, I did donate to these kids donation drive and I, and I sit on the board now of their organization, which is called Girls Helping Girls, period. So that piece of the work has never sort of escaped me, but, but as a lawyer and advocate by training, I really sort of turned my attention to where my interests lied and where my skills could be most useful. And that was really in thinking about how we change the policies and laws by which we live to better re reflect and represent all of us. And if excluding menstruation from our policies and public ways we live is holding us back, well, then that to me was the first thing that we needed to talk about changing. I love that this was a New Year's kind of a New Year's moment for you. Like, and it was this kind of triggering moment where it really began to have you ask questions. I know that when the first time that it occurred to me that even women and girls in America did not have the money or the funds or accessibility of menstrual products, it really kind of hit me in a way where I was like, this just doesn't feel, this doesn't feel right. I support an organization around the world. It's an organization called Days for Girls. And what we know is 130 million girls around the world are pulled out of school every year or every month because of their menstrual cycle. And they don't have appropriate menstrual pads or even reusable menstrual pads. And this particular organization raises money to make reusable pads and discrete pads so that girls can stay in school. So I think about not even only as this being a U.S. situation, but a global issue. However, we are talking about the U.S. So tell me a little bit about as you were digging into this, as this became kind of a lot of your kind of your focus over the last several years. I mean, 2015 was a little while ago. Talk to me about what you learned in regards to our menstrual cycle in regards to it being political here in America. Well, I'm so glad you mentioned actually the global context. And I love Days for Girls. I do, I do a lot of work with Days for Girls myself. That was actually the first recognition I had when I started reading about this. And again, this was a local thing that was, was posed to me or you know, posed on Facebook. Most of what I found described the intersection of religious and cultural belief and poverty and often a heavy dose of misogyny that was really animating what was happening in what, for me, sitting here in New York City, felt like, you know, faraway places across the globe. And it's true, this is a global issue, and, and there are global solutions and locally appropriate solutions happening in all corners of the planet. And I've been really fortunate to work with advocates and innovators from everywhere, from India to Kenya to Nepal to across Europe. And as you said, here in the United States, I think the bigger surprise or the bigger 
shock for people in this notion of, well, it couldn't happen here or, or the United States is somehow above this problem. That's ridiculous. That's not true. And I think that's the bigger surprise for people. Not that we've forged this fabulous policy agenda and, oh, it's a problem in the rest of the world. I think we started or a lot of people's mindset would go, oh, well, that that likely happens to poor girls in, in countries I don't understand, but we wouldn't let that happen to our own. And I actually think, you're right, 2015 is like dog years ago at this point when we actually think about our current politics. But, you know, it's like a, it's like the life I don't remember. Reverted, I feel. We, you know, oh my gosh, I just, my, one of my kids said to me recently, what were we mad about last week? And I thought, oh my gosh, I don't even know. Twitter comes at us faster and faster. But the idea, actually, that women in this country, girls in this country, marginalized populations in this country aren't actually undermined by our very systems is false. It's not just the few unfortunate who can't afford these products. It's that our entire systems are actually built and structured to not generate equality and to not ensure equal opportunity for, for those who need it the most. And that's probably been the heaviest, heaviest revelation that I've had in taking on this issue. It was funny, I was, I was on a panel recently and somebody was asking me, well, really, do you think they were sitting around thinking, how can we make menstruation harder as a matter of law? And, and the answer is no, nobody was talking about it that way. And I said, but it's not, it's not benign negligence. It's, it's deeper than that because the stigma around menstruation and the misogyny that, that has fueled it is obviously deeper than that. And the person on the panel said, more like deliberate indifference. And I thought, that, that's a great frame and that's a great way to think about it. There's been extraordinarily deliberate and clear uh, indifference and lack of interest in ensuring the well-being of, of especially low-income and marginalized women and girls and populations in this country. So there's no reason why this question of menstruation, one, should be separate from that, and two, shouldn't be political, because the solution that will ultimately help us all achieve equality and equal opportunity are policy solutions, which by nature are political. Mm. It's so interesting that you said that. I was thinking about the deliberate indifference. I have done a couple episodes recently with the one of the women I did it with is Maya Dunsenberry. We talked about how um, lazy science and basically bad medicine has left women misdiagnosed and mistreated. And I've dug deep into that research just to kind of look at how we've kind of deliberately indifferently, deliberate indifference when it came to researching women's health in general. And it's so interesting how it's playing out in so many places, especially in the healthcare system as well. And we're not talking about the healthcare system today, but it just, that kind of hit me because I had been looking for a language around that. You know, I don't think that medical schools or researchers sat down and thought, you know what, let's make sure we don't study women's bodies. (laughs) Let's make sure we don't see what type of drug interactions happen with their physiology versus a man's physiology but yet it happens every single day. And so I I really do appreciate that term. It gives me a lot of context. Yeah, it's a radical visioning of it. I know I will credit, it's an attorney, a wonderful attorney named Clara Sparrow, who is an attorney at the Women's Rights Project at the ACLU, who used it. And I've, I've written to her since to say, wow, that actually has given so much, so much context and clarity to being able to talk about this issue and I'm familiar with Maya's work and we've, we've shared panels together and same, same question about like how you asked about politics or policy. Is that sort of a separate thread or, or a distinct way of thinking about it? It's not. They're, they're all interconnected. How the medical establishment either deliberately turns away from our needs or doesn't acknowledge them is not only analogous with how the structures of political power work, but they're deeply, deeply interconnected. I mean, every single, every single institution that controls the direction of our culture have been driven by the same tenets of power, whether they're money, whether they're political power, they can't be separated. Hmm. I absolutely agree. It's it's good to know. I mean, we we sometimes we want to think about how they can be separate, but I appreciate knowing that a lot of it is it's absolutely interconnected. Now, there's a lot of women and a lot of people who don't think that there is even a need for this conversation, menstrual equality, menstrual equity. Can you talk a little bit about, you know, what it means to have menstrual equality and equity? 
The phrase and frame that I've been prone to using and, and, and called my book is menstrual equity. And I'll talk a little bit about what that means, at least what it means to me and why I started using it. And we'll see you know, where that takes us in this conversation. So there's, there's a lot of ways that activists and innovators and advocates around the world have, have framed the work to ensure that menstruation does not pose an obstacle in people's lives. So globally, a lot of this work was originally done under, under an umbrella called WASH, which is an acronym that stands for Water, Sanitation, and Hygiene. Activists really pushed to deepen that that frame, understanding that many human rights issues or many much of the vocabulary and discussion around human rights touches on many of the ways menstruation impacts people's ability to participate in society, in education, in the economy. It touches upon public health concerns and individual health concerns. So there's been a, there's been a push to broaden that frame, all of which are things that I subscribe to. But as I started thinking about what it would take to make policy change happen here in the United States, I worried that many of those words and frames and ideas wouldn't, wouldn't resonate with lawmakers here and particularly wouldn't resonate with lawmakers on both sides of the aisle. We don't do our lawmaking here in a human rights frame. Public health, as you flagged just earlier, is actually quite fraught. We don't, we don't even believe sort of as a people that healthcare is a necessary or required aspect of our lives. Even water, sanitation, and hygiene, I think we're, we're seeing more and more clearly, I'll often say the people of Flint, Michigan will tell us quite clearly we have a water, sanitation, and hygiene issues in this country. But, but by and large, that's not, that's not the, the language we speak. So I thought, well, what would be the way to bring in legislators who've really never talked about these issues and certainly never talked about menstruation in any sort of public way to have a framework that worked for them and tied to values that are uniquely American or uniquely American in terms of how we think about our, our lawmaking. And so equity was one, the one that really jumped out. It sort of almost harkens to the, the ideals of the Declaration of Independence, the idea of civic participation and full engagement in our societal contract. And if anything about menstruation, access to products, access to safe products, or otherwise inhibited or kept people from doing so, well, then it was our obligation to right that wrong. That's a lot different than saying it's a public health mandate or it's a human rights demand. That, that's just, that offers a different, a different way to call in legislators and engage them and get them to work towards a good outcome. That's what menstrual equity means to me. And that was kind of a long, wonky answer, I realized. But it, it matters to me actually a lot because I'll hear, you know, the phrase has, has, has taken root and, and it's used with a lot of frequency. And I'm excited about that because it's a frame that matters to me a whole lot. But it matters for those, those very, you know, sort of technical wonky reasons. For example, when activists will say, well, I believe in menstrual equity because menstrual products are a right, not a privilege. The whole idea of taking it into this language of equity was to actually take us away from the basic language of rights or privileges or entitlements because I wanted them to work and resonate with, with lawmakers who, who would not necessarily view their charge as stepping in on rights or wanting to advance entitlements. Very strategic. It was. Pre- I don't know. Actually, it's funny. As I tell the story in retrospect, I feel like it was very strategic. I think it was a work in progress. Yes. <laughs> Well, it feels, you know, when I talk about, we raised a hundred thousand dollars for days for girls last year. And, and my goal is to raise, raise a quarter million this year in two months where we got an audacious goal on the table. But to me, when we're talking about it, you know, we talk about it being a human, a basic human rights issue or basic human rights need, because that's the type of language I thought would move the masses, especially move women who, who felt very much for these girls who were getting pulled out of school every single month, who, who didn't have basic supplies. I remember it really hit me when I was at the airport and I started my period, I think right on my way to the airport. And I was going on a trip for, I don't know how long, maybe seven days or something like that. And I was like, Oh, I don't have tampons. Like, you know, and I went into the little store, like the little market in the airport and and bought them, you know, at the exorbitant, hugely jacked up price, right? Totally. $15 for eight or something. Exactly. That's the point. 
yeah, I could afford it. And I thought to myself, oh my gosh, like there's, there are women in this country who couldn't have done that. And there are surely women around the world who do not have that, who, that level of access. And that really was a moment, a poignant moment for me where I was like, this is a basic human rights issue that we need to address. But I love that you realize that that wasn't going to move the needle for us here in this country in terms of policy, that it needed to be approached in a different way that was palatable for our politics. Right. Well, that was going to be more than palatable. It was going to actually move them to action. You know what I mean? Not just that they would stop and listen, but that they would have the the vocabulary and the framework and then the tools that they needed to make pretty, well, you know, what would amount to pretty simple changes. So this policy agenda has taken off in ways that I don't even think I could have predicted or imagined back in 2015. I remember sort of mapping out what I thought a starting policy agenda could be. And I came up with with two core ideas, which were using agencies that served likely particularly marginalized populations, whether it's people who are incarcerated or people using emergency shelters or homeless shelters or low-income students. So it, w- it entailed you know, going to departments of education and departments of correction and asking them to mandate change to ensure that menstrual products were part of their budget and their repertoire And then I was aware that the fight against the sales tax on menstrual products, aka the tampon tax, which which lots of people know about now, was happening in full force in Canada at the time. This was, you know, around now the spring, early summer of 2015. And that was the time when Canada was successful in eliminating its national sales tax on menstrual products. And there was this live petition in the UK that was drawing a lot of attention. So I thought, okay, well, that is another really powerful way to get legislators talking about menstruation and the economics of menstruation, even if not necessarily getting to those populations who needed it most, if we're talking about, you know, eight cents on the dollar in terms of eliminating the sales tax. But the sales tax question also raised other arguments or other other statements about equality and equity. Why were these products not exempt from sales tax when other necessities were in most of the states? So those were the two ideas that I had for getting U.S. lawmakers involved in the question of menstruation and, and then you know, starting to frame it as this, this issue of menstrual equity so that they were, had, again, the right sort of framework and vocabulary so they didn't just shut it down and, and say, no, 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 this isn't in our bailiwick to do this or to think about this. So those have been sort of the heart of the U.S. policy agenda. And, you know, to make what's kind of a short story even shorter, in in four quick years, you know, starting with the 2016 legislative session, both of these tracks, access laws and tax laws, have seen extraordinary activity and success. So on the access laws, whether in schools or in jails and prisons or in shelters, over a dozen states have taken action for have passed laws uh, mandating provision of menstrual products in schools. Illinois and California and New York, and most recently New Hampshire, should point out that two of those were signed by Republican governors. So that's pretty extraordinary. You don't find bipartisan support on many things, let alone many things impacting women's bodies, let alone on an issue like menstruation. A very robust criminal justice movement that has been seeking to reform correction policy, especially regarding women through what's been called Dignity for Incarcerated Women Acts, almost exclusively now do include menstrual access provisions. So not only have those been passed in in multiple states, including, again, blue and red states, but that even passed in Congress. I think that's the the thing that people are most shocked by when I tell them that the last Congress passed a bill called the First Step Act, which is a broad-reaching criminal justice reform bill that includes a menstrual access provision, and our current president of the United States signed it. So take from that what you will. Trump is the signer of the first federal menstrual access provision in the United States. That is true. And same with access and shelters. These are bills that have had just extraordinary interest, support, bipartisan buy-in, and have passed at a faster rate than, than I ever could have dreamed. On the sales tax issue, Same. 32 states since 2016 have introduced bills to eliminate the tampon tax. 22 alone in 2019 did. And six have actually gotten it done. Same with a split of Republican and Democratic governor signatures and bipartisan buy-in. 
exciting is that this advocacy is about to take a whole new twist because this fall I've launched through my nonprofit, which is called Period Equity, with a partner, New York City-based company called Lola, who you might know. We have launched a new legal campaign to actually leverage the tools of law in addition to policy to make the case that taxing menstrual products or not exempting them from sales tax is not only inequitable policy, but is also discriminatory policy that is unconstitutional under the 14th Amendment and therefore illegal. So we are going to be part of an initiative that includes local councils from across the country who are going to be using the courts as well to make this argument. And our goal is to force the remaining, what is, which is now 34 states that still do not exempt menstrual products from sales tax, to do so within the next year. I know that the latest campaign has had a lot of activity, but I was curious to see how the tax-free period campaign was going in terms of, of well, in terms of progress. It's wild. So we launched this initiative in June of this year. We chose June as a time when legislatures were still in session in many states so that we could point out that while there had been progress with states introducing these bills, we were not satisfied that they were going the distance. If 22, put it this way, in 2019, where 22 states introduced these bills, only one fully got it done. That's the state of Rhode Island. California had sort of a a quasi victory in that they managed to write it into their budget this year. So for the next two years, the state budget includes an exemption for menstrual products, but that's not permanent. It's only that lasts only as long as the budget lasts, which is two years. So the idea of launching in June was to call out this sort of half step towards progress. This is great that states are bringing it up, but it's not doing us any good if they're not getting it over the finish line. So we were hoping that, one, we would push states to get it over the finish line while sessions were still underway, but two, really to announce that come 2020, there's no messing around anymore. So the project, the core of it is leveraging these legal arguments, and we are working with experts in constitutional law, in sex discrimination in the law, in taxation law from around the country, and we're going to be, that's what we've been doing all summer. It's been really fun. And we're going to be bringing them to New York City in September for a three-day, what we're calling legal action brainstorm. And we're doing that at Columbia University's law school with their Center for Gender and Sexuality Studies. But in the meanwhile, we had a main feature in the New York Times. We published an op-ed with a leading constitutional law scholar laying the groundwork for the case of the unconstitutionality of the tampon tax. So it's been, you know, sort of extraordinarily high energy and really, really exciting to be previewing and going public with these arguments that we've been toiling over for the past several years. We'll be bringing these folks together in September, and then more will be announced after that, that three-day convening about what the future looks like for legal action and the tampon tax. But as legislative sessions get underway in 2020, as the politics of the country sort of explode with you know, the lead up to the 2020 elections, we have every intention of keeping this issue in the limelight, not only because it needs to be solved in and of itself, but I kind of always joke it's the gateway drug. It's a gateway for talking about all the ways that our policies and laws, as we were saying earlier, don't reflect our well-being, don't reflect our best interests, don't reflect our reality. So if people can, you know, sort of get on board with understanding why the tampon tax is unfair and it makes them angry, it's not only a good way to get them involved in this advocacy campaign, but to get them thinking more broadly about how it is we should be advocating for ourselves and for to be fully represented and considered in all of the legal structures by which we live. I love the momentum that you're creating and September is literally around the corner. It is literally around the corner. <laughs> Coming up real quick for you. I love that. And I love that you're going to be trying to, keep, to do your best to keep this in the limelight. I mean, I know there are so many people, so many women who are aware of this and definitely feeling outraged about it. So I'm hoping that it'll continue. In terms of what we can do, as people are hearing these conversations, as these things are coming to light for the first time, you know, one of the 
I mean, clearly one of the things that, that I might focus on is more supporting Days for Girls, kind of a global initiative. And I know that they have an impact here in the U.S. as well. So clearly getting money into the right hands is a big way in which we can help support. But what is it just, do we be having more of these conversations? You know, how is it that we can continue to help move these agendas along? There's a lot of answers to that. And that's such a great question to ask because like you said, investing in an organization that provides direct services or, or really sort of answers to your own interests and passions and the things that sort of, you know, pull your heartstrings is, is really, really important. And Days for Girls is one such organization. And there, you know, and there, there are many here in the United States and around the world. Investing in and committing to policy change is also really important. Policy change not only helps the widest swath of people in that once we change our laws, we can change the realities for everybody, but it goes towards this bigger idea that we need to ensure that menstruation and other aspects of our lives are destigmatized, aren't marginalized. So supporting policy does both. We normalize the discussion around menstruation and we create a path for real change. So following a group like Period Equity, this is the nonprofit under which I do this menstrual equity work, is really important. And tax-free period is, we've got a website that offers lots of opportunity for engagement, ways to find out specific information about your own state's practices. My state has two years of yeah. funding. <laughs> <laughs> All right, there you go. Well, and that it includes messages that you can send to your legislators, to your governor, put on social media. We created some really, you know, kind of, crafty, cool graphics and stuff that are downloadable that you can share. So folks should definitely check into taxfreeperiod.com because there's tons and tons of resources there and they're going to be more and more as the fall unfolds. I should share as an aside, we're going to be setting up a mechanism for people around the country to sign on to legal briefs and other, other documents that will be part of the repertoire for this campaign. So there'll be a lot of opportunities for people to make their voices heard. And then the third goes back to what you just said about having discussions. Part of the way we destigmatize menstruation is by just simply talking about it and doing our part in all of the conversations that we have with our family, with our friends, with our children, with our colleagues at work about menstruation. It doesn't have to mean always proselytizing or chiding people for their own discomfort, but just demonstrating our own comfort in a way that perhaps models for those around us that we're not intimidated by talking about menstruation and hopefully neither should they be. You know, people will ask me often if it is intimidating to testify before legislatures that are largely all male or to walk into the offices of lawmakers ready to talk about menstruation. And my answer is always that it's the exact opposite. In fact, if somebody else is uncomfortable, you know, my goal isn't to make them more uncomfortable. My goal is to bring them along, but they give me an incredible opening to demonstrate from the get-go how we're going to talk about this, the body language we're going to use, the vocabulary we're going to use. And usually in the 30 seconds or minute or two, it might take them to gain their composure because they are uncomfortable. I can set the tone for all of that really quickly. And again, gently and kindly without making anybody feel badly for it. And I would always joke that, you know, nobody's ever melted into the floor. Nobody's ever combusted that having to talk about periods. They all come along eventually. Like nobody can't do it. So I like to think that by having done so with them, I'm improving the next conversation that they have, whether it's with their own family or on the legislative floor. Mm. It's so interesting, you know, that menstruation is a necessary process in our bodies in order to make all the humans in the world. It's kind of the essence of everything, right? Like there should be no reason why we can't talk about this. We all kind of rely on it. And reverence. <laughs> around this area. And yet we all grew up with those stories of, you know, kind of feeling ashamed and kind of whispering, you know, I saw Amy Schumer's latest stand up and just asking for a tampon, you know, like how quiet you are when I you know, can I have tampon? you know, or like gesturing or something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Or the whole, you know, everyone says the tampon up your sleeve and all that kind of stuff. Oh my gosh, right. Tampon up your sleeve. Gosh forbid. Like, hopefully you always have one that's big enough that fits into your palm. I kind of like twirl them around now when I walk to the bathroom. Like I make sure everybody can see them. (laughs) So yeah, exactly. It's like a lasso. (laughs) You know, as a, a women's hormone practitioner, I just, I'm like, this is not only a normal process that every woman goes through, but it's how we bring life into this world. And I hope that someday 
that shifts the way that we feel about it, the way that we talk about it. I've been to numerous period parties where we're, we're again, it's usually oftentimes little mini fundraisers where we're raising money for a good cause, but it really just hopefully over time slowly taking away the stigma of what, of what we were brought, at least even what I was brought up with, what my mom was brought up with. I mean, I feel like it's time that the tide is turning. I think it's turning too. I mean, even in the several years that I've been doing this, I remember when I first shared that this op-ed was being published and told people about my interest in this. Nobody, I mean, nobody was discouraging or anything, but they would say, really? Like that, that's what you're going out there on? It only kind of further emboldened me. I was like, hell, yes. Yeah. In fact, yeah, I am. 50% of the population. Yeah. And I have to say, I mean, I'm probably one of the older folks in this movement. I turned 52 this year. So for the five years that I've been doing this, I have to say my mind has just been on fire since all of this. It is is just completely opened my eyes to an entire way of thinking and advocating and communicating and existing that is so much better than the 47 that led up to it. My world is so much better for making periods public in my life and those around me. There's not a single thing about it that I think hasn't been spectacular. I can't imagine a world where I didn't do this. This kind of animates every thought that I have all the time. (laughs) Well, I want to say thank you so much. I'm not so much in the political realm as I am in the educational realm of helping women to understand how their bodies work. So we ask the right questions to our doctors. So we feel empowered with the decisions that we're making for our bodies because so often we're being misled one direction or another direction. And that it's all I think about. It's what I wake up to do. It's what I'm always researching. So I absolutely to that. <laughs> well, we're fortunate that you are. And I'll, and I'll sort of literally punctuate that by saying politics are personal. Politics are not something that exists outside of, of our, our bodies and lives. You know, our lives depend on it to some extent. Right? Everyone and everything we interact with is, is affected by the laws of this country. And all of this actually is political. So, you know, it's, it's something to embrace, I guess, and not be afraid of to say periods are political and the personal is very political. Hmm, I love that. Thank you so much, Jennifer, for, com- for coming on. Sharon, the work. My pleasure. Feeling. I love the journey. I love that it fires you up. You know, more women out there feeling fired up about this. I think the better for all of us. And I love that there is such incredible momentum right now that you are gathering. I, that's got to feel so good. And I'm holding big space for September and the months to come. I will continue to be on the lookout. I'll, the websites, all the links will go in for both the websites for for your nonprofit and for the period tax website as well, taxfreeperiod.com. So I just want to say again, thank you so much for sharing your brilliance and for committing to such an incredible and worthwhile cause. Oh, well, ditto. Thank you for all the work you do. And this was such a great conversation. It was wonderful. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Bye. My hope for today's conversation is that you are feeling more empowered and educated. It's important to be aware of the taxation on menstrual products and to know that women in other countries, including the U.S., don't have access to menstrual supplies every single day. If you would like to learn more about this cause and period equity, I would love for you to check out periodequity.org and or taxfreeperiod.com. Even just having these conversations and raising awareness about women's health care and our menstrual availability, our menstrual equity, just changes the way that we see women and we see healthcare for women. If you would like to also sign up for the second annual Essential Oils Hormone Summit, the registration link is up, which I'm so excited. It literally just went up this week. I have been waiting to let you know about it. It's just a little under a month away. And you can go and register at eohormonesummit.com. You will also find all the links for Jennifer Wise's information and the EO Hormone Summit in episode number 127. Make sure that you're plugged in to get those, to get those awesome links. And thank you so much for stopping by and listening in to the Essentially You podcast. On the next episode, 
I am bringing on researcher Dr. Sarah Hill to discuss the changes your brain experiences while on birth control, especially for extended periods of time or when you start birth control before your 20s, because we are still developing as women before our 20s. And when we start the period at 15, 16, 18, 19, major shifts happen, and it's important for us to understand what's going on with our brain chemistry. So I welcome you to check out this new show and the information that Dr. Sarah Hill is bringing to the table later on this week. Until then, have an amazing week. Bye.